Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Good. Hey, um, my name is Las Andres, and I'm the, the founder and CTO for a company headquartered here in beautiful San Francisco. And as you hear, I have a lot of strange accent, so I kind of like also come from the Nordics, but from the better half of the Nordics, the Norwegian place. But I, I heard that my <coughs> half brother had some good announcement uh, around open source today, so that that's a really really good news. So. We are a pure open source company, um, and I was going to bring you on a couple of people with me on stage later on today because I think you like to see, see things live and you want to see if it crashes or if it not. So, just going <coughs> to show you a couple of small slides and just to set the stage and, and also kind of like why are we as an identity company interested in graphs? Why do we actually think we need it to do what we want to do? So. So a little kind of like level setting here. If you think about it, a lot of people in the here the world word um, identity. They think about username and passwords, and they think about human. It's, it's kind of like a very limited uh, view of the world. Kind of everything has an identity, and identity is just a collection of attributes that describe something. So the, the, uh, a phone has an identity, a fridge has an identity, everything out there has an identity, and kind of like. An, um, how are you actually going to connect all these things? Things with humans, human uh, ap applications having things talking to humans, and, and vice versa. And this is where our company coming in. It's a pure open source company um, within identity, security, and privacy. Uh, uh, 400 people, um, and building this platform. And what we've seen over the year, I've been in the identity world for for a long time, and and. Uh, it used to be pretty simple. Uh, it was kind of like very enterprise centric. It was onboarding uh, new employees into applications. It was kind of like one user, it was an app, and it was a back end. The world have totally changed. And <clears throat> with all these things, how you connect it, how you're going to do the security, like an average household have at least 100 things they want to connect to, to your identity as a human identity. So I think we need to solve this in a different way. And of course, as an identity company, we, we see identity as the, the center of everything. Kind of like you, you can't do much without you kind of like selling something, having your service, and you don't have a clue who your who your customer is. It's kind of like I think you're gonna go out of business pretty fast. So as a, also the other thing I think around identity, and I see a lot of people think about this. Okay, security, privacy, identity. We'll deal with that shit later. It's kind of like, it's pretty simple. It's username, passwords, and kind of stuff. But if you look on our platform, which is the only open source platform on the planet, there's pretty a lot of uh, kind of like functionality and, and technology and standards that kind of like makes the whole layer in identity. So it's not all about authentication and authorization. It's, it's, it's all these kind of like technologies that you need to sometimes need to work with to get your application and services that are working. So, enough talking. I think uh, it'd be more interesting to, to show you uh, how we use graph technology, how we can protect the graph, how we actually can enrich our own uh, software from a security perspective, how we can do real-time authorization using graph and all that kind of stuff. So I would like to welcome my uh, team member, um, Ashley, up to stage and give you some live demos. Thank you, Lasse. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you about <clears throat> and demonstrate in the next two demonstrations throughout the rest of the session uh, two different themes that kind of come together and centralize around the word relationship. And we heard about relationships quite extensively this morning in Emil's opening. And you see here we're saying, how do we securely manage these billions of relationships between people and things? And so that's the first theme is security. But there's a yin and yang between security and user experience, whether that user is an enterprise uh, employer contractor or especially if that user is a customer and the experience that they have. And the key turns out to be that the level, the richness of the relationships that you have, that you understand between your customer and their personas across different lines of business or their relationship to things or your enterprise employee and their relationships to activities that might indicate a risk profile, it's the relationships between those things that give you the insight and are poised to add new levels of value to the identity management paradigm. So in the Fordrock Integration Labs, we're looking at something right now that we're calling the relationship layer. <clears throat> and you see that up here in the, in the red dotted lines. So 
The interesting thing is there's something that identity management does really well today already that we can build on top of and add new value. And that is we in identity management world and in the Fordrock open source platform connect to all different kinds of data sources already so that we can bring all these different data pieces in and reconcile them, make sense of them, and then traditionally pull that together so that we can provision new accounts, new entitlements, um, different attributes out to different systems and then pull those back in the traditional joiner, mover, lever type of enterprise um, identity management paradigm, right? But now we can take that same capability that we already have and the fact that we're already connected to all these different sources within the enterprise and we can build a new layer, what we're calling the relationship layer. So what you see on top of here is we could take key different pieces of attributes, not all the data that's at all the resources, but the right pieces that we need, and then weave together relationships between those, and that's where the graph comes in, and that's what we've built here with Neo4j, so that we get this new cross, um, so, sort of cross vertical, if you will, cross silo set of relationships that give us a whole new set of insight. So think about this in terms of your customer scenario where you've got a large enterprise with multiple different lines of business. You've got users registering with different account names across those lines of business. And you wanna know, you wanna have a 360 degree view of who that customer is and what kind of experience they had when they bought a product or subscribed to a service online, when they visited your brick and mortar, when they called your help desk, what kind of experience did they have? Was the context tied to what they had been doing? What about the latest tweet or the latest social media post that they did with the hashtag or, or including your company's name? Being able to take some of those key pieces of information and pull them up into what we're calling this relationship layer and then, and then extract value about that, about who your customer is, what they're looking for, what their experience is. Think about in the enterprise scenario where you've got uh, your, your internal employees and contractors who are responsible for keeping your mission or your, your customer facing processes up and running. You wanna be able to understand a risk profile to mitigate insider threat, whether it's intentional or unintentional. And so the theory here, theory here is that when identities are required for everything because every single thing and person and business process is connected, you've gotta have the identity as the basis to establish online trust and all the relationships that you can build between those will add this new level of value um, across. So I'm not gonna end yet. That's just my thank you for the slides. Let's get into some actual demo. Let's see if we can not confuse the projector too badly. So, what we're gonna do is we're going to um, go through a couple of persona scenarios, three different people, and look at the different ways that they're related to things out in an environment. So we're gonna start off with a private consumer, okay? And so meet Sam Carter. So Sam Carter is gonna log in here, and what you're actually seeing in this login page is um, one you're seeing in the second one behind the scenes, two pieces of our platform. This is OpenAM or Access Manager, and the security theme here is this is how you protect a website or how you protect someone's access to data coming from a thing or to go remotely manage a thing. So this is OpenAM controlling my access to this actual portal. And um, Dave Bennett's gonna show you um, some really interesting inf uh, ways of how you can actually restrict from a granular perspective what you can see in the graph itself in Neo4j using the Fordrock platform. So what nodes and relationships can someone see based on who they are? So, and in the meantime, let's log into Sam Carter here make this a little bit bigger. Okay, this is um, me releasing some of my information so that it can be used to determine what I get access to. So on this dashboard now, I'm a private consumer, so I've bought a single um, uh, device, okay? And uh, it's a UPS battery in this case. <clears throat> so there I see I've got one device. I'm not a big enterprise, so I don't have a whole lot. If I click on the relationships tab here, this is a real-time view into Neo4j and the relationships between myself uh, Sam Carter, and the fact that I own this device with the serial number AS1, and there's a relationship between this device and the, ser and the model type of that device, which is an SMT, blah, blah, blah. And then also I can see who sold me this device, um, okay? And then here's another interesting thing, just a little show of the 360 degree view. So I registered in this portal as S. Carter, but it just so happens that in the sales automation tool, I was registered as Escalahi for some reason. So that's just one example of how I could be registered as different names in different lines of businesses or in, in lines of business, but there's a single view of this is Sam Carter, this is who I, his identity, and these are the, uh, the different aliases, which I'm known as. So now I bought a new device, and I wanna pair a new device 
to my account, which I'm authorized to do. So I just did that, and, and that, um, using the RESTful interface, created a real, uh, real-time new relationship in the graph. So now that I can come see AS5, I paired that to myself, but I can also now see who sold that to me. That was a relationship that was already there pre-existing, but just because I made one link, I got a new relationship that was already there that I didn't create. And that's another key value, is that just by making one link connection sometimes, it opens up a whole new world of different connections that you have in the graph. So I think that's another uh, key and interesting point. So that's OpenAM and OpenIG, our identity gateway behind the scenes um, protecting the access. And we'll come back now, that was a, a private user. Now we're gonna come back and look at a partner user in a second, but let's, let's take a quick detour and let's talk about for a second, how do we get that information um, up into, I gotta click on the right link here, there we go. How do we get that information up into Neo4j, up into the graph in the first place? So meet our other two products, OpenIDM, Identity Manager, and OpenDJ, which you'll see in a second. So remember when I talked about when I showed the relationship layer piece about you go and connect to all these different data sources and then you have a way to reconcile that information and do something with it. Well, that's OpenIDM and that's what its purpose is. And in this case, we've taken our scripted REST connector capability and we've built a connector to be able to talk to Neo4j through its RESTful interface. And we use that connector along with the rules and the mappings that go along with it to both inject a series of nodes that are people-based and another series of nodes that are relationship-based or uh, uh, nodes that are device-based and then build relationships between them. So um, <clears throat> we did that. And then if we go down and look at these mappings, you can see here's the relationship layer mapping specific for a device. Here it is for the user. So we'll go look at a device. We have the ability to take whatever inbound attributes are there that we're bringing in from whatever our target source is, those bottom verticals, if you will, from the picture, and then we can map it to something new. We don't have to call it the same thing when we reconcile it and push it up into Neo4j or up into the relationship layer, as we call it. We also have the ability to uh, modify the behaviors so that if we're doing reconciliation and something comes in and it's ambiguous or missing or whatever it is, we can either have default actions that we can select on it or we can write a script to do something custom with it. So that's how we're actually getting the information, the data from the various different data sources up into the relationship layer. So now let's go back to our user personas. We talked about Sam Carter. We met him, he is a private consumer. So now we're gonna go quickly meet Sue Mason. And Sue Mason is a business partner of Acme Smart Device Enterprises. And so what Sue does is she actually is partly responsible for selling and in other cases for maintaining uh, some of these smart devices. So when Sue logs in, the first thing that you'll notice is that she's got a uh, access to a much longer list of devices, right? And the list of devices that she's actually able to see and do things with is also driven and built by the relationships that she has within the graph database. And so she can see, for example, oh, this battery needs to be replaced. Let's say she's gone out and dispatched and a ticket's been completed. She can actually go interact or retest that device after it's been fixed and get a new status on it because uh, the, the access manager has the ability to control signals that are sent uh, to the remote devices. Now, if we look at Sue's uh, relationships, we'll see they get a little bit more complicated. Um, this is also a real-time query from Neo4j. Sue can see all the devices that she sold, the serial numbers of them, and some of them, this may be a little hard to see, that she maintains as well. But if she didn't sell them, she could see that uh, S. Peterson sold these other devices and what they are as well. So it gives her that view into her world based on the relationships of the things that she manages. Now, there's one more persona that I wanna show you before I turn things over to uh, Dave, and that is an employee of actual Acme device company. So let's say I am Stefan Triplett. He is the last user in, our, uh, in this part of the demo. Now, Stefan is an employee of Acme device manufacturer, and so he has a little bit of a different role. He is the key account person for customer A and B, and also partner A. And that means that he has the ability to see what's going on with devices that his company sold to consumers, to enterprise customers, and to partners, and so on. So he's got more menu options over here that are also driven by relationships. So in the first example, if we wanna come over and see the relationships of a location of devices or where they were sold or where they exist, he can click on that and we can pull location information out of the graph that's associated with the devices that he's allowed to see based on his relationship and then he could see a heat map of where these devices live and where they reside. Now, of course, he can come over here and click on his relationships, which get much more complicated because everything that's associated to customer A 
he can go over here and see, well, here's the key people that I work with at customer A. Here's the people at partner A. Oh, by the way, while A. Shelton has really been doing an awesome job at uh, selling lots of different devices. So, so that's really great. Um, so this is just to show you that building rich relationships, again, between people and things and the different personas of people and things is going to not only A, we can use these relationships to manage who gets access to what, whether it's what access you can get to um, data that came from an IoT device, or whether or not you can reset a valve remotely on that device, or whether a device can talk to some other cloud API, or whether a person can share information with another person, all these different scenarios, you can make a more rich experience by creating that rich level of relationships in the graph between all these people and things and being able to ask those questions in sort of real time, that rapid scale. Remember Emil saying this morning, we're looking at, we're just getting into the part of the curve where we're gonna hit you know, 50 billion connected devices and millions of connect, connected people. Well, imagine how many relationships have to be in place to make sense of all that, knowing that when uh, devices um, are, are being connected, if they're not secured properly, that's gonna be the easiest way to get in from a security breach. So all of that has to be secured. So. Um, Building relationships uh, from an identity management world, we call it identity relationship management because we really do see the relationship as being a key part of the future uh, to managing digital identity. So that's my piece. I'm gonna turn it over to Dave Bennett who's gonna um, walk you through an excellent uh, demo that uh, will show you some really cool stuff. I won't give away your secrets, Dave. I have a couple slides too, and a couple demos. So I'm gonna bounce in and out of uh, slides and stuff. Um, anyways, my name's Dave Bennett. Thanks for coming out this afternoon. Uh, this is really exciting to be here at Graph Connect again. I was here last year and I really liked it a lot and uh, had a great time. Uh, I was invited to that integrator meeting yesterday, but uh, I couldn't go because I was busy integrating my demo. But anyways, I know I'm between you and the next Fika, so I'll be as quick as possible. Uh, basically, I'm gonna talk about uh, two, two different demos, two discrete sort of demos, uh, same data set, but uh, showing two integrations between Fordrock and Neo4j. Uh, the first one's gonna be an OpenAM environment condition plugin. And basically, this is a way of extending the, uh, the OpenAM uh, product and basically using the graph to do relationship-based access control. Um, so basically we're gonna perform authorization decisions in OpenAM based on uh, Neo4j Cypher queries. And uh, the next thing we're gonna do is uh, using OpenIG, which is like another product that Ashley was talking about, which is uh, an identity aware API gateway. And so Ashley's talking about using it to protect devices and things like that. The other thing we can do with it is we could proxy products really easily. And so, Right now I'm proxying the browser and transaction endpoints, Neo4j, and I'm basically running that OpenIG in a Jetty container, and then there's a, there's a OpenAM access manager agent in front of that. So keeping the whole thing tied to the access system and allowing me to inject some identity data about uh, the user, the logged on user into the container. So we're gonna perform a few identity aware queries. Okay, so the first one, the environment condition plugin. Uh, this is just sort of the overview of what you're gonna see. So OpenAM sitting up there and it's got an authorization plugin and that authorization plugin is talking to the Neo4j uh, database. At the same time, the OpenAM product is protecting uh, the time machine service. Uh, what good is a back to the future day without some back to the future stuff? Anyway, so the OpenAM agent sits there and intercepts all the requests, so make sure that we're dealing with an authenticated principle. And the time machine service just writes data to Neo4j. Uh, OpenDJ over there is maintaining the user's sort of like core identity profile. These are the things that uh, we know about the user for sure, username, password. And OpenAM is gonna host a login form. So the idea is to restrict access to, to the time machine. Okay, so how are we gonna restrict access? Well, it seems to me that a lot of, 
headaches could have been avoided in Back to the Future had Biff not stolen the time machine and been able to go back to 1955 and create an alternate future in 1985. So, given that in mind, and what do we know about Biff and Biff's family, I figured that Biff was a leader of a gang, and he was related to members of gangs. So I thought that maybe restricting access to the time machine might be good if people were known to be members of gangs. So we have a query here that basically checks to see whether a person has a close affiliation with gangs. So a member of a family, you know, works through a family. So even if that person themselves wasn't a leader or a member of a gang, but they had a family member that was a member of a gang, this would return sort of a positive result. And again, if you're not, you know, a couple hops away from a gang member, then you're kind of clear to travel. So, how does that look? This is a, how do you make things look cool when they all happen beneath? So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to uh, just log in to Neo4j browser. I'm just going to log in as Marty and uh, going to show off a little query about Biff's. Here's Biff's gang family. So we've got the Tannen family, and you can see that they've got like a, a history of starting gangs. You know, Griff, Biff, and all the way back to Buford. They each had their own gang. So I mean, this is pretty concrete. This guy's got it on many, many counts. So let's see what that, that quick query looks like here. Oh, it might be hard to see back there, but it does say, is gang affiliated? And we're going to run that same query for Marty. And it says, not gang affiliated. OK, so those are the queries we're going to use. Now we're going to actually just test this out. So uh, I'm going to log out. And I'm going to log back in to the time machine. And this time I'm going to log in as Oh, I'm going to log in as Marty again. Probably shouldn't have logged out, but here we go. So I'm logging in as Marty. Time machine's up, ready to travel. So I'm going to request a travel destination. Every machine knows who I am this time. I'm sending my, uh, hey, look at that. Thanks for traveling. Perfect. So that was the authorization plugin saying, hey, we know Marty doesn't have any gang affiliation, so we're going to let him travel. If we log out and we request the time machine again this time, so like if they had left the time machine a little bit, you know, more secured, if Doc had gone back in, uh, in 2015 when he did the hover conversion, he could have prevented all of that misfortune from the middle of the second movie onwards, right? It might have been a bit of a revenue hit, though. So, okay, I'm going to sign in this time as Biff. So Biff signed in. He's in the time machine. He's going to re request travel. Here we go. Oh, he got a 403. Biff was denied access. It's beautiful, right? OK, so let's just go take a quick look at what that looks like in OpenAM. So this is the uh, OpenAM policy interface. And here I have a few policies. So I have the, I'm going to show you this next, but this is protecting Neo4j. Uh, and then this is the protecting of the Time Machine app, so you get authenticated when you, and this is, this is protecting the time travel service kind of thing. And this is where we put the plugin. So basically, in this, I've got a name for the policy, I've got, um, some resources that I'm protecting. So I'm protecting future travel and past travel. I could theoretically break these into separate policies and I could say, you know, past travel requires more security, you know, even further gang, you know, affiliation further away uh, than future travel because future travel has, you know, potentially less impact on things that have already happened. Um, here uh, is just what am I protecting? It's just a get. My subject conditions are just authenticated users. And then the environment conditions. So this is the environment condition plugin that we wrote here. 
And all this does is it takes you know, a Neo4j database and a cipher query, which I showed you already. It's kind of hard to see here. But uh, we're binding in the user. And then what we do is we map the results that the cipher query was returning, not affiliated and affiliated, uh, to a positive or negative result or allow or deny access. And that's it. It's, uh, that's Biff not traveling back in time and ruining the future. So next. So OpenIG is a Neo4j gateway. So like I said, uh, OpenAM restricts access to things. It uh, provides authentication and authorization services. OpenIG uh, you know, handles the requests to, uh, that was interesting. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, OpenIG is gonna handle the requests through to Neo and it's proxying the database and browser or the DB and browser uh, endpoints, or not endpoints, but prefixes. And uh, it's filtering out the cipher. What happens is the requests come in, the user's not authenticated, they get authenticated. Um, if, uh, and the user's got some attributes about them that will control access to their queries. Uh, when the filter comes in, it catches the DB and the, the, the browser endpoints, and it basically shunts them off to a Groovy script where we're gonna do some policy enforcement, if you will, or some cipher query re rewriting, really, is what it is. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, this was something I wanted to do like a long time ago and I never really had a cause to do it, but this seemed like a really good opportunity. So, and I was pretty excited by Emil's, oh, whoops, uh, Emil's announcement this morning that uh, OpenCypher was gonna be launched because I think that really could play into moving something like this forward. Uh, anyway, let's uh, move on. So this is, this is what a, a user entry would look like in the directory potentially. So you see, I, I basically at the bottom, you've got all these sort of Neo attributes. I'm, I'm certainly not supporting all of these things. This is strictly a, a, strictly a demo, but uh, I have the idea that you, know, you could have allowed actions. So maybe you're only allowed to do matches or deletes, or uh, maybe you can do creates, hard to say. Maybe uh, when you have a context, you have a context of you know, a company or yourself. Uh, so maybe you can only see things around you. Um, maybe you're only allowed to query for certain labels uh, in the directory or in the, in the graph database. Or maybe you're only allowed to see certain numbers of entries back. So we want to put like a hard limit on what you can do, but somebody else can see something else. Um, or maybe you're only allowed to traverse a certain you know, set of hops away from yourself. So if you had like a, a neo context of self and a max relationships of two, you can only go out to two levels. Uh, and maybe there's different roles like admin and query. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna take a look and see what this looks like. So again, I am gonna go back to browser here, I'm gonna log out as Biff, and return to, this time I'm gonna select the Neo4j browser. So this, I selected the Neo4j browser, but instead of getting to the browser, I get shunted off to a login page. That's simply the agent not seeing an authenticated identity and sending me there. Uh, so now I'm gonna log in as Marty, because Marty has, Marty has no restrictions. We trust Marty. He threw that uh, sports almanac in the garbage after all. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do an all people match. So super simple query, gonna return all the people in the database. And we get 54 nodes back. So got that. Now I'm gonna log out and I'm gonna return to the login page. I'm gonna re-request the Oh, no, not the time machine, wrong one. The browser, and I'm gonna log in as Biff. Again, so I'm logging in as Biff. Biff's got some healthy restrictions on him. We saw that, that five node, node limit before. Biff is gonna run the same query, because you know, this is like an internet cafe, and people keep their browser cache all there. Biff only gets five nodes back. What this is, is again, it's, OpenIG has got an identity. Um, it is, and the, uh, the Jetty agent is setting properties about the user from their profile in the container. And the container then is taking those properties 
and using, using uh, that Groovy script to rewrite the cipher with some limits. So, and then it submits the query back through Neo4j and you get the result back passed out to the client and that's that. So, anyways, something I wanted to do for a long time and I did it and I, it's kind of cool. But uh, I'm gonna just run through a few credits here. A uh, guy from my office helped me out with uh, the environment condition plugin. Uh, without him, that part of the demo would not have happened. Uh, so great, great kudos out to Hadi. And then, uh, you know, the, the DeLorean time, time uh, circuits, I was gonna make one of those with this, like the picture and do exactly that, but of course somebody had already done that, so we just borrowed that. And uh, the Back to the Future wiki was critical for getting all those relationship data. I had no idea who Buford's gang members were. And that's it, Dave Bennett, I'm out of time, thanks. Any questions? When you modified Biff's um, query, yeah. on what layer did that happen? Because did it happen before the before it was submitted to REST? It, to it would. It happened before it was submitted. Yeah, yeah. So it came in, and I handled the request, and I took it, and I changed the original request to have a limit on it. I did another one with starting with Biff, I, so I like, did a match on Biff and then a width. I was screwing up the rewriting, so I didn't finish that one, but. So that doesn't really prevent anybody from calling that same endpoint without your modified. Uh, well, if you didn't let them have access to the endpoint, if you force them to go through the gateway, you, you do, you could prevent them from doing just that, yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, I actually, there's one more thing I'll add to that. Uh, in the, in the notion of denied stuff, too, I was going to not even pass that back to the endpoint, but just return an error to uh, the client. So if uh, I got a list of, uh, this is something still to do, too, but uh, if I got a list of, uh, you know, lay requests you weren't allowed to make, so if you made a delete request, for instance, and you were not allowed to delete anything, I was going to you know, prevent it from being passed through and just handle it back as a response back at, with an error message kind of thing. So I gotta try that too. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Hi, nice talk. Uh, Thanks. How do you identify Biff? How do you prevent Biff from assuming another identity or creating another login? Well, yeah, so I created this login for him. Uh, so I guess Biff could theoretically, you know, beat somebody up on the street steal their login, beat it out of them. But uh, you know, if they had a good solid two-factor authentication system instead of a user password, uh, I think we could probably prevent Biff from getting your identity. Maybe if Biff had a Google Authenticator uh, login, which you know, OpenAM supports all that stuff, so you plug in whatever authentication module or modules you want, you can chain multiple ones. Uh, we can chain multiple policy conditions together too. Yeah, and I would just add that that's, um, th that's one of the, uh, the, the reasons to have a comprehensive identity platform where you can tie all this stuff together because, as Dave mentioned within OpenAM, if you have a strong profile for Biff and if, he ha if his account is not just IP and password, but he has to do some sort of strong two-factor authentication in order to get in, then y you have the ecosystem around that to support someone else not being able to impersonate Biff easily because of all the other security measures that are in place. So when you combine that, with something like OpenIG, which puts as a reverse proxy in front of, the, uh, intercepts those requests, and that's the only path to get to those requests, now you're able to add that level of granularity and so on. So I think it's an important point that when you pull all of this together in, in an identity platform and you're using it to both protect a granular levels of information in the graph and then get value back from it, that's where you're gonna see the next layers of, of value come from identity. Uh, one quick question about the integration of uh, the other identity information or the policies, yep. how you keep them uh, you know, in real time with the rest of the SaaS-based application or LDAPs and other things in the open end? How do I keep the policies up to date? Up to date and you know. I guess uh, if you're, so that's, that's the thing. I mean, I think to make the policy as generic, the cipher, is that what you're talking about? Like make the cipher as generic as possible and like you have to understand your model for sure. 
uh, and if your model if your model changes and you're asking for something that's no longer valid, you know you're going to get uh, 403 every time, right? Or if your model changes and you end up granting too much access to something, so I, I think you really have to just it comes down to writing your cipher carefully um, and not not anchoring it to physical things, but to the to the users and the resources. So um, testing you know the nature of the relationships and being able to being able to express your query as small as possible as, as short as possible you you uh, I think will limit your problems right so when we I showed you just the query that was in the context of the user but in that in that context we still also have the requested resource so regardless of whether the you know it's whatever the resource is really it could be any resource um, we could find the user and that resource in the graph, and we can do like an all shortest paths query, and uh, and you know evaluate those things. Quite a few options, but I, I would rely on the dynamic nature of the con the context, right? The user and or the resource. Yeah, uh, I just add to that that I, I think it's really interesting that the graph and relationships themselves can add a new layer of abstraction for policies, so that you can express your policies ultimately at a higher level, and the nature of how the relationships change between things will actually implement or affect the policy decision, so that in effect, some relationships are helping to determine policy decisions, and that gives you the ability to express policies in a more simple, abstract layer. So the graph itself and those relationships can actually empower simpler policies in the end. You definitely have to know your model, though. Like, yeah. Is any more? All right, Pico.